Hey guys, this will be video 18 for the Design Build Flying V, and uh, we got a lot of ground to cover. And hopefully, by the time uh, we I end the video, uh, we will have a neck epoxied in and strapped in place and ready to glue overnight. So basically, what I'm going to be covering in this video is I'll briefly uh, go across, go through the the heel shaping again in preparation for actual um, analysis and fitment. And then uh, I'll go into uh, the, the, the things that you really want to be thinking about when you're actually uh, preparing to do your, the, obviously the glue in, but in order to uh, start fitting it. Uh, because obviously it's very unlikely that it's going to just fit right, right, into, right into place. And you're going to have to start uh, assessing uh, what's going on and what's causing any issues or not that it's an issue, it's just, you know, what, what do you need to start uh, shaping in order to, to get it to fit properly? Because when you get ready to put the, the clamp on this or clamps according to how you do it, and when you get ready to start putting the strapping pressure on there, you, you want to be on cruise control. You, you don't want to be sitting there figuring out how to uh, lower this side to get the base uh, side under control or shim under this side you know you, you don't want to be sitting there fighting anything uh, so anyway well, so in other words I'm going to try to spend a lot of time talking about that uh, and some of the what ifs that you'll be running into and and why it's so critical uh, well regardless of whether you're doing a Floyd Rose a Bigsby across a traditional uh, bridge and whether that bridge is like a, a, a Gretsch where you could actually just move the bridge around or whether you're doing like a true uh, stud into the body. Uh, it, it's all critical, but it, it, it gets exponential when you start uh, factoring in uh, what the Floyd Rose was actually intended to do. And, and, and the reason I like this design build is because uh, it's, pre it's, it's, a, it's pretty high performance. And there's a lot more going on here. In other words, if you can pull off building a guitar with, with a Floyd Rose and doing all this fitment, uh, you can pretty much build, uh, you could probably move fairly quickly into building like a, a Les Paul-esque type arch top guitar. So anyway, uh, and then what I'll do is uh, in so doing in that discussion, I will automatically be covering uh, outside dimensions of the fretboard path and all that jazz and then our trapezoidal quadrilateral uh, conversation and then uh, I'm gonna uh, transition into by default I'll, I will automatically transition into uh, how do you mix epoxy and I know I've already covered this several times in other videos but I gotta treat this video as if someone just tripped up on this one video and uh, I'm going to cover in fairly extensive detail about how to mix your epoxy. And, and I'll just go ahead and say, uh, don't plan on using a five minute epoxy or a short, short time epoxy. That doesn't give us enough time, working time. Because even though I'm about 100%, 99% confident, I'm not going to have an issue. Uh, the only reason I'm thinking that is because I haven't discovered what might present itself. And the last thing I want is to realize, oh, you know what? I just realized this and I completely overlooked this. And now you're sitting there with a five minute epoxy that you're gonna be jumping through hoops trying to uh, 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 correct issues. And we don't want that. I love the 24 hour epoxy cause I can put this thing together and if, uh, I decide to go a different route, I can pull it out and I can just, you know, start over. All right. And then I'm gonna, by default, I'm also going to be showing you how to actually set up and use the clamps and then how to uh, uh, use the, the strap as well. So let me check the time and uh, make sure we're rolling. Uh, we're at four minutes, about 30 seconds. All right, so what, what, where, where were we in the last video? In the last video, uh, we finished up with uh, talking about the heel and all the shaping, and I'm not going to go back into detail about that. I really didn't do anything here other than about uh, three minutes, maybe five minutes of uh, uh, 
like this kind of stuff right here. Uh, it's very small. I don't know what the diet. That's a little over an inch, but it's very small. But even though even though this is a three inch diameter or a one and one half inch radius, I can roll this to ma to match. And where I'm going with this is I, I took my templates and I drew everything again, and I realized I was pretty much there. But I was able to spend just a little bit more time. Uh, kind of doing this right here staying off of that flat and I'm going to spend about 30 more seconds with this and then we're going to move into uh, the other stuff but basically this is this is where you really start moving into uh, you know how does it feel and how does it look and if, if you can see something then you know you're going to feel it but sometimes if you don't see something, you'll, you'll feel it and you'll realize, yeah, I got a little bit of a knot right there. Or maybe that's not quite finished. Uh, the cool thing about where we are right here, uh, we can always finish it up on the net. So you have, to, you have to discipline yourself to realize I'm close enough right now to, to do the fitment. So when you get to that point, uh, discipline yourself to realize that's it. That's it let's 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 call it a day and then you leave it alone but uh, nonetheless you do want to do some mental mapping and ask yourself if I'm a player and I'm moving from the the low register up to the high register do, do does it does it feel like it was intended to be on that neck and this is this is that's pretty important because if you're playing this real sleep this is a pretty fast neck it's got a real soft D and if you're, and I could see this guitar ending up in the hands of someone who likes pretty fast melodic playing. They don't want to come down here and all of a sudden hit a, a chunky 50s uh, heel. So I got that sweet soft D in there. All right, let me stop talking about that. Other than uh, what is critically important uh, before I forget is uh, this is where you need to have your lacquer thinner close by. And uh, let's see what it looks like because once you wet it, it might start revealing. It might start revealing some things, and you can use that wetness to to let the the shadow of the light come across it, and then you can just verify that yeah, I'm I'm ready to glue it in, and then before you forget, just I've already done this, but you just get it cleaned up. You want to get the dust off of it. I like using the lacquer and or lacquer thinner and or an acetone because that allows me to, uh, to, to make certain that I'm, I'm just nice and clean in preparation for the epoxy. Uh, I'm not going to talk about doing this with tight bind, although it's, it's fairly similar, but I'll cover working with tight bind some other time. Uh, I did do a little bit, um, um, uh, a little bit, uh, more shaping and I'm, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and cover this briefly. Um, I, I actually opened up this binding and I did a little bit more shaping in here and then I closed it back up because, uh, I felt like I was going to, um, I felt like I missed it by about 20 thousandths and I just wanted to make certain that I was really, uh, not going to have to take much of the binding off, uh, meaning, meaning thin. I didn't want it to start getting thin. And I feel I feel really good about where I ended up and uh, and whatnot. So let me let me move away from that conversation because I don't want to digress into uh, what it took to do that. But in so doing, one thing that is important is uh, when you get to this point, uh, you do want to kind of uh, clean up anything that might be difficult to access after the neck is glued on. And, uh, but also be careful. Like when I did that cowboy wipe right there, I hit the black. I was like, whoa, I, for I forgot about the black not having clear coat. But if you did do that, I'm trying to get my binding clean, but you don't want to drag any of the black up into it. So uh, that's just one of the, the things you'll do. And that just kind of comes naturally to you. Or, or you can just do all this glue up and fitment. Uh, and do all your cleanup later. Where I'm going this, well, the reason I like doing that is because if there's something wrong or there's something that I want to change, I, I, want, I want to have it really nice and clean so that um, 
I'm almost looking at it in component form. And I'm also looking at it from the standpoint of, let's say someone ordered a body from me and they're, they're in Sweden or they're in Australia. Uh, you know, if he tell, if this, this guy or this girl tells me, yeah, I want this to be uh, two and three sixteenths and I want, uh, you know, this to be this dimension, this pocket to be that dimension, et cetera, et cetera, then that's exactly what I'm going to send them. And I don't want to send them something that they're having to shape down uh, in order to fit their their neck. Now, if they change gears and go with a different uh, neck or something, that's their issue. They, then they can deal with that. But I want to make certain that I either deliver to unto myself, <laughs> you know, so that it's easy for me when I'm at this point and I'm doing a video for everyone. I don't sit here with a binding that's hanging off 40 thousandths and my binding is only 60 thousandths. And then when I start scraping the you know what down, then, then it becomes transparent. So there you have it. So spend a lot of time with your engineering and uh, it'll make a difference. Uh, he'll fit now. And, and let me just do this. This this is kind of where I would where I would begin. Uh, I'm sitting there and I'm beginning to make that transition of uh, how do I pitch the bottom. I uh, probably should have left that on that just for a little bit longer. Uh, how do I pitch this bottom? And in, in other words, how do I marry up this this location right here to that? You know, that area right there that has not been um, uh, pitched yet or it hasn't had its final route work. Well, the safest way to go about it is just take your paper and, and that's T for treble. And I know that it's that's the direction because that is pitched. Not that it matters all that much once it goes in there, but it is directional. So I make that template. And then I, I simply ask myself, you know, well, how well does it fit in the body? And then, uh, well, I'd say it fit perfect, <laughs> you know. And uh, let's see if I can get that up in the camera. So it, it's perfect on its height. In other words, the bottom of my uh, tenon is not going to be floating uh, uh, an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch or even a thirty-second of an inch. It's it's kissing. I mean, it's just literally just kissing that wood. And if this were tight bond, I would prefer it not only be kissing, but literally resting on it because I'm going to put crushing pressure on it if I'm do, using tight bond. If I'm using the epoxy, all it's got to do is just kind of sit there. And, and this will make sense once the guitar is finished. But as you can see, um, that, is that in the camera? I'm, at, I'm not sitting here. Let me look. I mean wet my fingers so I can control it. I'm not looking at anything crazy like this right here or like that right there. Uh, everything's everything's uh, in order. All right, so once I once I verified that all was well, and I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but the cool thing about all of my setup for my machining and that pitch, I hit it the first time. So not being arrogant, but just it feels good when you... Uh, when you can um, just go right to the finish line and it and it work and that and I say that to say this, uh, don't let it discourage you if you don't because very rarely will you go straight to the finish line. It's very frustrating and it's very stressful. And the more you can accomplish on the front end, the better. Uh, and if you if you're really paying attention, let me see if I can do this without putting a clamp on it. This thing is so big. It's like trying to handle an F-14. All right, so you see that's, that's my pitch. And the cool thing about that pitch, is that showing up okay? Uh, what I'm talking about is that, that pitch, I can't even reach it. Where it's cantilevering, where it's floating off the, off the body. Uh, the, first, the first thing I want to do is make sure that that's consistent. And if it was inconsistent, I would prefer to see the base side a little bit lower. The last thing you want to look up and see and see the base side riding high. Should you put the base side in a little bit lower than the treble side? Eh, it's your call. Some guys do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, just at a minimum, just make sure it's level, and it'll usually work out okay. 
All right. So now that I've got that fit, let me see if I can get control of this thing without. Yeah, I got it. It's so tall. I can't even. I can't really control it. One one of the things you're going to want to do at this point is come in here and start asking yourself. All right. Once you feel like you've got it fit fitting fairly well, you can come in here and start doing some tracing. Let's see if I can get that in the camera as well. This is hard to do on camera. It's easy to do if you're just sitting here building it. But basically, you want to transfer our finished neck. See, our, our neck is pretty much finished. And we're going to be shaping the body to the neck and not the neck to the body. So we have to ask ourselves before we glue this thing in, uh, uh, you know, is the binding in a good location? So that once I trim up to that pencil line, is there is there binding left? And this is all the more reason why I mentioned, please don't do binding on your first guitar. It's an effing nightmare. and It'll just work you to death. Don't do binding on any of your guitars until you've built two or three guitars. I had to do binding here because I was doing the sparkle top. And I hadn't had the nice transition. And even though I've built guitars for a long time, I still fought the binding. It's one of those things. It's, it's, a, it's an art form. And unless you do it all the time, uh, it'll, it'll, it's really frustrating. So I asked myself, all right, do I want to do any trimming or do I want to leave alone? And that's so close, I said, leave it alone. I can shape that by hand uh, later on. There's so much I could do. That's literally um, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, and that's a thirty-second of an inch right there. And because I reworked the binding a little bit up here, uh, the binding on this side is pretty much coming out perfectly flush. And over here, it'll just get trimmed a little bit on the bottom. All right. So the next thing... If you did, I, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about what ifs because whatever whatever you're running into, you're running into one of three different things. And this is where, where we can relate the flying V to actually an aircraft. Uh, and you pilot, pilots out there will understand the whole roll, pitch, and yaw axis. I might have to turn it this way because I might have to sit in the pilot seat. When you're, a, when you're flying an aircraft or you're installing a neck on a body, <laughs> you're dealing with the same three uh, axes that you would be dealing with when you're, when you're considering like a CNC machine, setting up a CNC. You're either dealing with a, a roll axis, which is the X, and that would be roll. Just imagine this is the airplane, and it's a neck, obviously, but this is the roll axis right here. And that would be the X axis. Or we're dealing with the pitch, uh, which is the Y. And the pitch would be this right here. Well, guess what our pitch is? My pitch is two degrees, right? So I've got a two degree pitch. Um, and then uh, our, the then in flying, it's called the, the yaw, uh, Y-A-W. And yaw is the Z. So it's the final axis. And this is, this is considered yaw. And if you want to go one step further into flying, that can be controlled with your rudders. And then we'll finish the series talking about how to slip if you're landing a V. <laughs> and you can either slip from the right or you can slip from the left. So anyway, so you got your, your X, Y, Z axis or the roll, pitch, and yaw. And, and how does that relate to a, a guitar? Identical to that of an aircraft. We're either we're either uh, we're either rolling like I was talking about. We're gonna we're gonna if we're gonna roll anything, let's roll the base side down. Okay, I'll exaggerate. That don't don't do that. But I'm saying if you if we were gonna roll, we sure as hell don't want to roll the the treble side down because our our bridge will be running on a crazy cattywamp angle. So if we were to roll, let's roll the base down. Uh, uh, roll pitch would be the next thing. This is our pitch. We, we determine our pitch with where we cut this with the miter saw. And then that determined everything that once we pitched that uh, plane in the bottom. Uh, and then our, our yaw, our yaw is where we manipulate our, we manipulate the yaw in order to, uh, uh, achieve the trapezoidal path, P-A-T-H, the trapezoidal path, so that the base side 
that the, the, the treble side of the fretboard uh, lands over a certain mark down there at the bridge, and then the bass side of the trapezoidal path lands over the uh, uh, mark at, at the bridge as well. Now, and you might be thinking, all right, all right, we've already covered that. But again, the reason I bring these things up is you got to have all of that worked out when it's dry. If you don't have that worked out and, and you go and you go wet, you're it's going to be a nightmare. So, so now that I've got all that stuff worked out and I've clamped this up, I've put some pressure on it and I've verified that my trapezoidal path outside the fretboard lines up perfectly. I'm ready to glue this in. I, I literally could clean off the table and only have the strap and the C-clamp and, and the epoxy and glue this up and walk out of the room and not even check it. And, and I would know that it's going to go where I want it to go. So on that note, uh, let's uh, talk about what would be the next. Because again, I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to start discussing what if. What if it's rolling or what if it's pitching or what if it's yawing? Then you'll have to make your uh, corrections according to what's in front of you. And there literally could be there could be three different things going on that affect all three of those points. And if that be the case, then you really made a mistake at, uh, working up to that point. You should have already addressed those things. All right, so again, and what's the main primary reason we're doing it is because we're, we're wanting to optimize the, the Floyd of the Rose, the Floyd Rose, not only from a functional standpoint, point, but from a visual standpoint, because even an untrained eye could look down and see that the Floyd Rose is off. It's very important that you get all this nice and true because it's very, a very much an industrial type item, and and you'll you'll see it if it's off. All right. So and then the next thing I've already talked about the outside path, and then uh, based on that, looking at my notes, uh, it's time to mix some epoxy, and uh, then I'll show you how to tin it, and then we'll finish up by showing you how to use clamps. And hopefully, let me check the time, hopefully this will be under 35 minutes or so. And the question, I'll, I guess, I guess, let me think. No, I don't need to pause. Let me just move forward and get the stuff off the table that I don't need. And I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a cough drop because I probably won't be talking very much. And I'll just kind of let you. Look over my shoulder. I want to protect my and the reason I'm doing this is because um, I want to protect the Delmar drum wrap. Bear with me for a second. Again, I started to do some of this stuff prior to doing the video. It's like, no, oh, I need to just, I just need to let them look over my shoulder and kind of see how I, how I would go about this. And then the question would be, yeah, I'm okay with some of that showing. I don't want that tape to risk. Yeah, I don't want that tape to risk interfering with the bedding. But since my neck is is since my neck is going to be, um, let me make sure I use the right terminology. Since the fretboard is going to be floating above the Delmar, I want to be able to reach up in there with with little uh, sticks, and little pieces of material, and get any epoxy squeeze out out of the way. And when the guitar is finished, you'll understand why. But I won't spend too much time uh, worrying about that stuff right now. Or I won't spend too much time explaining it to you right now. But other than what I will be doing is... Uh, let me do this.
Where is it? Won't take me a second to show this. After it's all said and done, is that in the camera? I'm going to be coming under here with some ebony. This is the shaving off a fretboard, and I'm going to be sliding that ebony up under and between the Delmar and the bottom edge of that fretboard. Because when you look at my guitar, you'll see a really substantial um, uh, fretboard. It won't be the chintzy little uh, 3 16ths of an inch out here, a quarter inch in the middle. It'll be really nice and beefy. Even if you didn't, now I won't run it on the end grain like that, but even when you look at it from the end, if you didn't do a pickup, you wouldn't see any of that stuff floating. That's why. That's why I want to put that there. So that it's easy to uh, clean out and wash and then uh, go from there. All right. All right, let me do this. Let me, I'm going to pause briefly and I'm going to set up in preparation to start mixing the epoxy. And then, because uh, I don't want to waste any time, and then we'll come back and we'll finish out the video. All right, let's uh, dive back in and uh, talk about T88 epoxy. Uh, T88 epoxy, uh, very quickly, is a two-part resin and a hardener. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's, to my knowledge, the only epoxy that the uh, home-built aircraft industry um, accepts. I, I, I may be wrong about that, but uh, it's a great product, and I won't go into too much detail, but... It's about, I paid about 50 bucks for that right there. And it, I'm not saying I'm cheap, but uh, why waste it? And if you look at that pocket and you started mixing this up, you might miss it. But if you go ahead and just literally calculate the area, this is the base. And, and in other words, this is the base area right here. And this is the back wall. And this is the side wall and the side wall. And now all you do is you just... Um, you do a one-to-one -one ratio as if you were covering that area. And um, let me do this very quickly, and then it'll make perfect sense. And what, what it will primarily do, it'll keep you from getting uh, cheap at the end and try, trying to stretch um, your epoxy if you don't have enough, or it'll keep you from having so much epoxy in there that you're fighting a, a, a nightmarish mess. <laughs> so that's that's the key. And, I, and that if you see my point, all I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna match those little points with my resin. Just do it very quickly and then I'll I'll talk about it. There's really nothing to talk about. It's just a one-to-one -one ratio. But by by doing these little lines, it'll keep you from uh, having to like weigh it or measure it and stuff like that. And it just guarantees that you're you're close enough for the whole. Now I'm I'm probably gonna have too much. But uh, I'm okay with that. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to briefly mix this, and then I'm going to uh, probably pause the video because uh, there's no is that in the camera? There's no sense. Uh, th this is a, a bamboo skewer for like doing um, kebabs for like grilling out. I love them because I'll show you a trick here in a second. The one thing I like about using these rather than using a flat putty knife because I can take the skewer. I don't, that might not be in the camera. I'm kind of low. I'm having to do it off the edge of the table. But I can take this skewer. This is, this is hell to do. And I can, I can pull every bit of that over to the middle, roll out from under it, push it over, roll out from under it, clean up the bamboo skewer, push it, roll out from under it, and then I'll have to come off it. So, so I can keep pushing all this over to the middle. If you really want to, split some hairs you do this on a parchment paper and you'll guarantee that you don't have any uh, risk of your resin or hardener soaking into your paper now once i get it over to the middle then i'm going to take
Then I'm gonna cut that skewer off so I keep the crap off my hands. Then I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna mix. And we're gonna mix, and we're gonna mix, and we're gonna mix, uh, probably for two to three minutes, minimum, not max, a maximum of, of about three to five minutes. Is that overkill? Probably, but if I'm building an airplane, then I'm gonna be out barnstorming the pastures and terrifying the city. I wanna make sure that thing doesn't blow apart at me. So I'm gonna take the time to mix this. And uh, the reason I bring this up is uh, if you guys have followed any of the series, you know that uh, I, I lived in South Florida for quite a while and I lived on a boat. I restored a 1973 post sport fisher yacht, a 40 foot long cedar, cedar hull, cedar hull on mahogany frame. And it was critical that I learned how to mix epoxy <laughs> because I was mixing this stuff just, you know, day in and day out and a, and a good painter buddy of mine that I made down there. He's a boat restorer and professional painter. He taught me about mixing epoxy, uh, how it had to kick on a molecular level. And most people don't mix it enough. They look, they look at that and go, Oh, it's mixed. It's ready. And they start gluing their parts together and they deprive it of oxygen too quickly. And it's almost like putting it back in the bottle and, and it doesn't, it doesn't, truly truly cure it probably will cure well enough but um my theory is if you really if you've really been following my series and you saw what i was able to do with the les paul top that was amazing and that even shocked me because uh what, what i'm about to do here we're going to mix some black resin in this we're going to tint it even and um uh, when that epoxy cures, um, and I don't mean sets, but when it cures like three or four days from now, it'll be rock hard and uh, there won't be any uh, glue lines. Now that doesn't matter here, but I want you to learn how to do this so that if you've got a damaged guitar, um, you can use this 24-hour uh, slow cure epoxy and uh, man, you can uh, you can bring stuff back to life because once this cures, you can shape it like wood, and you'll have incredible tonal uh, characteristics as well because the epoxy is real good. You won't have a, a, a water-based glue in there acting like a rubber gasket. And if you guys have been around for a while, you you've heard me say that numerous times already. But the key is to have a very uh, very hard surface. Let me check the time. I'm going to pause the video because we're over 33 minutes and I don't want this video to be over an hour. Okay, now that we've let the epoxy sit for about um, maybe 10 minutes or so, max, it doesn't really need any longer than that. Um, if we're going to tint it, uh, I like a black resin. You could get this at like a Hobby Lobby or any um, woodwork shop. Uh, I basically just uh, the only thing you need is just uh, kind of just for this, for that amount right there, put it on the side and then pull, pull from that little puddle what you need. And then uh, you'll be far less likely to risk uh, screwing up the strength of the epoxy. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do, I'm just going to show you very briefly. Uh, and then, because I'm after I do this, I'm going to pause it again and let this sit for about five or ten minutes, maybe maybe four or five minutes. Yeah, see that was plenty. It it only took a very small amount uh, for this to uh, change the color. So regardless of what, uh, it, like if you're working on a you know a red body guitar and you you know. Wanting to tint your epoxy, well, yeah, you could tint you could tint it red, uh, yellow, green, whatever color you wanted wanted to, to tint it to. I like I like doing the black because in the event I started sanding down um, and got a little bit too close, well, then it wouldn't reveal anything clear. It would be consistent with the paint color. And uh, I had briefly mentioned that uh, I play saxophone as well, and I restored a vintage alto saxophone mouthpiece with this very identical formula right here. 
And uh, this was like a mid 1940s, very valuable mouthpiece that um, I got for a, a steal. But nonetheless, when I restored it, uh, I, I spent a lot of time working with this whole epoxy mix to determine, you know, what was the true, the best way to work with it and have a, a mouthpiece that was not only strong, but, but looked good and also had incredible tonal characteristics once the work was finished. So let me pause the video and let that sit for a little while and then we'll be ready to start gluing it together. What I mean by the, uh, the mouthpiece is, uh, in other words, I'm not guessing with this stuff because this is not something you want to guess with and then, and then realize three days later it's, it's not drying. But if, because where I'm going with this, if you had have just mixed the resin and the hardener and then the tint all together, it probably would not have bonded on a molecular level and it probably would have never dried. Or if it did dry, it would have dried very rubbery. All right, let me pause. Okay, we'll start back up with the epoxy and the glue in. And right now would be the time to ask yourself probably two things. Uh, well, it's too late now because you got the epoxy <laughs> sitting there kicking. Uh, if you were going, if you were going to do a pickup, you should have already done it <laughs> by now. You should have already routed that. Uh, I'm, I'll do that later uh, because whomever buys this guitar, they might want a different setup. So. But this this is the correct time. You should have made certain that this hole was big enough to receive the wiring for the bridge pickup. And you should have just kind of done a final call. Let's say maybe you were doing a prototype and you just really loved what you had come up with. Right now would be a time to make your template because you could lay your acrylic up there and clamp it down and you could take a router and you could just route what is beneath that acrylic. And then when you build the next guitar, it'll go about 10 times quicker. So right now, before you glue all this in and turn it into a guitar, you would uh, want to have covered some of those things. Uh, see how well the bamboo skewer works? Stuff is very thick. It doesn't, it's running, it's running a little, but it's very much controllable. And the cool thing about uh, what I'm doing I'm going to work a little bit fast here. I'm going to treat this just like I would a uh, uh, tight bond where you really want to smear it into both surfaces um, when you're gluing the two pieces together. So I'm going to get a little bit aggressive on this and then I'm going to pull it up the side. I hope that's in the camera but I, and I'm going to try to keep my hand out of the way. But I want, I want to uh, rock it through this because this is almost the equivalent of watching paint dry and I don't want it to get boring. But basically at this point, you're, um, now you see why I got the tape there. And I failed to mention, I'm gonna pull that tape off here in a second. Uh, I'm not gonna be leaving that tape up under the body. Cause I got, th as soon as I shut that off, I was like, oh man, they're probably thinking, well, how are you gonna get the tape out from under it once it glues? I mean, once, you know, once the neck is glued, I won't leave the tape in there, in other words. But basically, at this point, you're just, uh, you're just covering the surface. And uh, you're making certain that you don't have an excessive amount. One thing I will briefly mention, let's say when you were doing all of your uh, dry fitment, you realized, oh, man, I just, I, I thought that one and a half degree pitch was going to be enough, but it's just, it's going to be dangerously close. Well, then that right now is a good time to just epoxy this little fillet in, in the back, and that'll raise the back of that up. And the cool thing about this epoxy, it'll fill in any voids, and nobody will ever know that you changed your one and a half degree pitch uh, neck up to two degrees right there at the, in the final, final call. So nothing wrong with working with little shims like that. And even on the side, on the bottom, on the front, in the front corner, in the, in the front top, the front bottom. If you're sitting there fighting something, this is why I love the epoxy. It is the training wheels that will just really hold your hand all the way to uh, a very, uh, very guaranteed good job. Because what you're going to see here in a second... I think I got enough on that because I, I got the surface 
I got the surface covered. Um, I almost lost my train of thought. The train wheels guarantee. Yeah. Uh, the reason I love the epoxy, uh, I jokingly always say I could go make a pot of coffee right now. Uh, maybe not a pot, but I could, I could certainly go get a cup if I wanted it. Um, if you're working with tight bond, man, these joints have to be really, really tight. They need to be very precise and tight bond is extremely unforgiving. Uh, meaning that if, if you had some gaping areas in there, that tight bond is going to turn into a rubber gasket. It's still going to be an exceptional guitar. Because I know 99% of the guys out there building guitars, they're, they're using tight bond. But I love the epoxy because I can sit here and do a video and not be wound up about, you know, trying to get this thing glued together and clamped, I mean, put together and clamped before, you know, the, the uh, glue starts tacking on me. So where I'm going with this, we got all the time in the world. I'm not going to digress and start talking about other stuff, but uh, it's just so, it's, I hope that's in the camera. I might be a little bit high in the beginning. Not very important. As long as well, I say it's not important, it's the reason I'm doing the video so you guys can see this stuff. And um, I'm sitting here asking myself, "Have I got enough epoxy?" So yeah, I got plenty. Because I don't want I don't want this crap oozing out all over the place. So yeah, bunch right there. But the cool thing about this design, uh, this thing is going once it glues, and there are no if, if there are voids in there, the epoxy is going to fill, the, fill those voids and uh, it's going to turn this guitar into basically a through body design. Uh, and I won't talk about repairing it because if, you know, that's a different video in itself. If you're repairing something that's epoxied in, well, you better be good with a router because you're not going to be, you're not going to be taking this apart with steam. Uh, it's pretty much permanent. And, uh, but from a tonal standpoint, it'll be stellar. All right, I'm going to put a little bit on the front here. Why? Because we are covering all six sides. And I hope I don't forget to explain that, but let me get this covered first. When you're, so I got some tape. I forgot to, uh, see, this is a cool thing about the epoxy. I just found a mistake. I set it down. If I could go get a cup of coffee, I wanted to. I forgot to trim that tape. But I want to keep it on there. All right, did that stay in the camera? Yeah. Uh, and that allowed me to not risk tape, uh, gluing tape in between the, the join. Um, am I, is this overkill? It's getting pretty close to it, <laughs> but my theory is if you're gonna if you're gonna build something, let, let's go ahead and build it absolutely as best we can, because uh, the whole tonal thing and the appear we'll, we'll clean up the appearance later on. Uh, we'll deal with it if there's appearance issues, but right now while we're doing all this structural stuff, see there's no sense in going across the bottom because that's going to get a cap if I elect to put a cap. So, all right, I may be wasting a little bit of time, but I think this is one of those things where, if anything, I'd be just really interested in watching. I'm gonna put a little bit more down here just to make certain. Uh, if I'm gonna have, where would I want it to push? Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it up here. Because if anything, what's gonna happen, I've completely failed to mention, before you uh, fit this, you don't want the back of the, of the tongue or the tenon to be uh, uh, interfering with the, the surface in the back. If anything, because you want this to bed really well on either side. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to try to remember to pull it back out so I can get that tape off. But uh, that's, this is all you're doing. 
This is all it takes to, to do a neck. And what happened was when I did do that, it pushed any epoxy forward. And uh, I'll tell you what, let me do this. Let me, let me, let me, I'm going to pause the camera because I'm going to clean this off up here on the fretboard and then I'll come back. We'll finish it up. Okay, let me finish up with the epoxy here. This is what I used to clean that up. Just came in here and uh, scraped it off and went across it with a little bit of lacquer thinner. You don't have to get it perfect, but you just want to get it so that there's no, no bumpy areas under there. Because once you're fitting, once you're fitting your uh, ebony wedge, you don't want any interference because that's that's pretty much going to be inaccessible as far as uh, doing everything. I'll make sure I'm clean. Um, and I'm going to do this. I, I won't have to, I won't need this anymore. Not directly under me, but you can see the importance now of, of mapping out the square area that you need to mix. And if that's all we have left over, that's an incredibly efficient mix. And you can see we don't have a whole bunch of crap oozing out. And I'm going to do this one more time. Um, and I kind of went, I kind of went down mostly from the top, which was obvious. And now I'm, I'm holding it by the crotch and I'm just, I'm just pushing into it. Now I'm still going to pull it out one more time in order to get to the epoxy. Let's see what it looks like. See how easy this is? And what's so cool is the vac I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it the benefit of the doubt, but the vacuum of the epoxy is just guaranteeing that that neck is not going anywhere. And I don't have to worry about any rubber gaskets or any of that BS. Uh, and you can see she tried to slip a little bit right there. I'm I mean I'm moving it intentionally to let you know, let you see how you can still you can still take it apart. You could never do this with tight bond. Ever. You do that with tight bond, you might as well be building basketballs. <laughs> but, and you would think, oh, you know, an epoxy is really hard to work with, and that's really only for the, only for like the master level type woodworkers and stuff. No, man, are you kidding? Epoxy should be like elementary. And there you have it. And now what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit here for about 10 minutes and I'm just going to think. And uh, I'm going to pause the video one more time because I'm basically going to sit here and, and I'm just going to think about how I want to present the whole, the whole completion of the clamp up. But I literally do, I, if I were just, if I wasn't doing a video, uh, I would probably be sitting here for about 10 minutes, just kind of holding it by the crotch. I'd, I'd probably have this clamped over to my workstation table. It's lower, it's more accessible because when this, when this epoxy begins to uh, set, not kick. I always like to clarify that because we, we need to know the difference between epoxy kicking. When epoxy is kicking, that's when you have mixed it and it starts kicking on a molecular level. But once it kicks, then you can start working with it. Uh, once it starts setting, uh, then uh, it starts getting difficult to pull out of this pocket and put back in. You, you might be able to pull this neck out one more time uh, over the next 10 minutes, but I, I wouldn't do it any more than what I've just done. Because right now, you should have already, uh, well, I've already covered that. You, the last thing on my mind is right now is, oh, God, I hope I'm close to those lines up there. I would bet you that magnifying glass over there, I'm going to hit it dead on. I don't even have to think. And I, I would say I could go cut the grass right now, but I didn't. I cut the grass two days ago. It looks great. So it took forever. But what I'm saying is you just want to stand here and you want to bond with your subject. 
And you should be patting yourself on the back right now because this is a huge accomplishment to get to, get to this point. You got a beautiful guitar beginning to materialize and you can see the finish line. And the cool thing about all this epoxy squeeze out, uh, I can come back four hours from now with a chisel and carve that stuff off like clay. It's just incredible. And another thing, uh, guess what it's doing? It's filling in any void. If I had have screwed up on my join and the left side had a huge gap or was all screwed up, that epoxy is going to fill that baby up. And I'm, I'm, it's going to make me look like a pro. So I think if anything, this, this should be a really good video in relation to the build. And I'm looking at it from a symmetrical standpoint. It's really beautiful. It's really cool. All right, so let me let me pause the video. And I'm going to sit here for about 10 minutes, and I'm going to think. And then I'm going to show you how I would go about. Uh, well, probably one thing you could do just, just to be kind of safe. Let's say you had to go use the bathroom or you had to sneeze or something. Just, just do that. That's just enough. That'll allow you to relax a little bit, relax your muscles. And maybe, if anything, let it kind of help you. And you can just push in on it from the end. I don't. It's not moving. I mean, the, the thing is basically, I could, I could probably just about leave the room, right? flip off the lights, leave the room, and this guitar is ready, ready to rock within 24 hours. But let me pause the video, and I'm going to think about things a little bit and how to proceed with finishing out the video. And hopefully, this is cool. We're we're under 52 minutes, so hopefully. Um, I'll be able to keep it under an hour as well. Hey guys, I'll start the video back up. It's probably been about uh, probably 12 to 15 minutes since I paused it. And uh, I just really wanted to spend some time with it um, and make certain that I uh, didn't rush anything, but also make certain that once I did come back, I would have everything um, in, a, in a position where it was easily uh, understood as I started talking about it. I guess probably the most important thing you would want to do, or let's put it this way, the least important thing would be this strap. Uh, believe it or not, you just really don't need that much for some. Now, granted, I like it. I, li I like the strap once I truly am finished, but you can see how there's just almost no tension at all because you can truly run the risk of uh, getting things off and uh, so just proceed with caution with your straps. But the most important thing, um, the, the, let's make sure this is in the video. I mean, this just, it's just finger tight. It's, it's not, it, it's, it looks massive because it's a C clamp. But uh, I'll do a flyby. This is the base, the base side join. Looks excellent. Cleaned it off a little bit rather than just letting all that squeeze out because I got to think, I thought, no, you know, I really want to see what's going on because it had a big puddle of epoxy there. And I got to thinking, I thought the last thing I want to do is make the assumption that it's bedding perfectly. And there might have been a little cricket that got in there and it got crazy or something. So I, I feel better getting that cleaned off so I could assess it. Have my little medallion in the back with the faux leather between the body and the 3 16th inch dowel, I mean 3 16th inch uh, piece of plywood medallion. And um, I've got a little bit of faux leather between this little piece of 3 16th. You can do that if you want. That That's really just a piece that was from building a case where I was turning a curve, but it follows the curvature of the neck a little bit. Again, there's, there's no pressure on this neck at all because uh, I don't want to, I don't want, you don't want to crush the frets into the, the thing. But now if you were doing a tight bond, you would definitely want to have your uh, clamping call scalloped so that it, it, it put no pressure on the frets at all. That's critical. It's very, very important. If you're, if you're putting clamping force, don't clamp into the frets. I'll, let me turn it around so you can kind of see, it's basically just a, uh, well, I didn't, let's see if I can get in the camera. You can see the candle. The, the, let me just look in the camera and I'll stop talking. What I'm trying to show, oh, I said I would. I'm trying to show this, uh, this uh, 
tr tri triangular area that's open. And it's floating. And if I can, I can see it where I'm standing. Let me just start looking through the camera. I'm sorry about this. This, this is, I know this is crazy as hell, but I'm trying to show. I can see the tongue is what I'm saying. I can see the tongue up under the fretboard, and it's so cool. Uh, but I, I can't find the perfect angle and the pitch on the camera to expose it and then get the light perfect and all that jazz. But all I'm showing you is that I have a cons I have a consistent overhang right there. So I'm excited about that and a just ginger amount of pressure. So that lets me know that I'm bedding well. And let me turn this crazy thing back around and just sit it down. Uh, but for the most part, up here, oh, this is pretty important. I'll just hold on to it. You just make certain that you stay in the center and you can put some tape around that to hold your strap in place while you're getting everything kind of in place. And then you always obviously want to have a little board under there so you don't start scratching stuff up. A little piece of tape made certain that if I had some sort of crazy issue and I had to start flipping the guitar around, it wouldn't fall out. So you have to do a lot of forward thinking. Now here, here's the here's probably the most truly most important part of the whole setup. Now that I've got all this clamped up, I have this C clamp with all this extra space and all this open area. I can visually sight down the side of the fretboard, and I can see I can see my target. Oh, oh now I'm so sorry. I bumped the camera. Jeez. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what I, I probably bumped it when I was talking about uh, just making certain that you have your strap uh, tape so it doesn't move on you and then a block of wood under it so you don't scratch anything. You can use the tape in order to hold that little block of wood in place. And then uh, in case I didn't cover it, I've got the medallion with a leather faux and everything's lining up and I got the cantilever and what I think I did get to show you guys was uh, I have consistency in the overhang and I'll stop talking about that because I apologize I probably cover that too much anyway but the most important thing was to make certain that I had this C clamp and I'll finish the video after this in that position right there the strap so that I can sit it down and relax and take my straight edge and hold my straight edge along the top side of the fretboard and just I'm, I'm siding down it right now and what I see is exactly what I wanted to see I see the black line that designates that area I don't have anything encroaching on the, on the fretboard over here do the same thing look above it it's perfect I mean it's when I say perfect it's it's exactly where we want it so she's ready to sit overnight and just let it dry and uh, I can't think of anything else I should talk about other than probably the one of the single most important things you could could address right here at the end is uh, put this up in the camera this is so so important and I learned this from Robert Benedetto and it's what I call gravity and glue uh, we slide our paper in there check it out no glue after 15 minutes and I'm going up under that little corner there that lets me know that I don't have to worry about any glue squeeze out uh, interfering with the little wedge just flip it around and check the other side and where I'm going this if you stand this guitar body up on its feet or on the, the end of its wings and you had a lot of glue in there it, it could it could run out and damage your body it would run out and just you'd come back and and you would have uh, made a mistake so gravity and glue is critical you can use gravity to your advantage so that the glue would flow in a certain direction but let's just make certain that we don't mix up too much epoxy and and if that's if that's all we get out of this whole build I'd say we did pretty good so I'm going to get that off your fingers before you mix it anywhere. So I covered how to use the clamps and the basic ratchet setup. And then basically at this point, what would I do next? 
um, just hang out with it, you know, and just kind of keep an eye on it. And then uh, just to be safe, this is pretty critical. I'm glad I'm doing this off, off the hip. Uh, when you have epoxy in there and you start putting pressure on it, that epoxy will just very, especially if you put too much epoxy, you might get a false reading and think, oh, I'm perfectly lined up and everything's going really good, et cetera, et cetera. And then after about five minutes of this, just five pounds of strap tension, it pulled that neck in and squeezed some epoxy out. And you came back and there was a little cricket in there. Something got crazy. Or let's say you didn't come back. What a great mistake that would be. Because you'd come back tomorrow and find this thing is off a sixteenth of an inch. Not going to be dramatic, but stay with it. And don't don't be so cocky that you don't pick your straight edge straight edge up every minute or two and just make certain that everything is staying aligned. Because we got one shot at this. Uh, once that epoxy cures and sets, you might be able to get it to break loose within about uh, six to eight hours, but I, I doubt it. You'd probably do damage before you'd get it out. Uh, you, you'll be able to get it out within the first couple of hours. But uh, let's not go there. Let's let's do all of our planning on the front end. Do it right the first time. And that way we know that we're going to have a good build. And we've just crossed a really monumental hurdle and threshold. And is it in the camera? I'm, I apologize about the camera work, but uh, and I hope I was able to cover what was really critical and important enough that uh, that it made sense. But it's not that difficult to, to glue the neck in if you've done all of your uh, uh, machine work and everything up to this point. Uh, and you know that everything's really accurate. And you literally, if you want to know the truth, I didn't have to do any of this clamping or strapping. I could have just stood here over the table and just kind of sat on the bar stool and held it in my lap and just kind of squeezed it together with hand pressure. And then uh, as it started uh, setting, meaning actually drying, I could have wrapped a masking tape around it. <laughs> it would have been fine. And it would have been per just as good as if I've got a little bit of clamping force on it. So, all right, I'm going to check the time. Probably about right at an hour, a little bit over. And uh, uh, I'm not sure what will be next, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I appreciate you guys staying in the ring. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks.